A Bitcoin ETF was just launched, but there's some things they don't want you to know. Now, we've been hearing about a Bitcoin ETF happening for many, many years, about seven years now at this point, and it just got approved. We have a Bitcoin ETF that's launching, and many people want to know where is the price of Bitcoin going to go? Well, I want to show you what we are expecting, what type of inflows we're expecting, and where the price could go. But I also want to talk about what this Bitcoin ETF really is, because it's probably not what you think it is. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of dangers. There's a lot of fees that they're sticking into this that you need to know about. I want to talk about some of the dangers that this poses to Bitcoin and what you and I should be doing about it. So let's go. All right, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Mark Moss, and I make these videos to change the way you think about money because almost everything that you've learned has been wrong. Now, we are gonna talk about this Bitcoin ETF and some things that they don't want you to know. Now, if you go back to the oldest videos on this channel, the first, I did a four-part video series, the first videos I made years ago, and I was talking about Bitcoin, uh, Wall Street coming for Bitcoin, things they would do to try to capture it, um, ways that Bitcoin could defend itself, and we're seeing that happening right now. So I talked about this years ago, and here it is. It's live. It's launched. Um, now, I want to talk about some of these things with Bitcoin um, and what this means. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the news has to say. Uh, so if we if we jump onto the screen right now, you can see we're looking at um, Zero Hedge, and there's, they're talking about this Bitcoin futures ETF to launch. Um, and of course, like I said, there's been about I don't even know how many attempts over seven years to get this through, um, but we can see that finally a Tuesday morning ProShares launched the long awaited ETF on the New York Stock Exchange and it's linked to Bitcoin futures. Uh, we can see that um, this um, ETF will give investors exposure to Bitcoin without having to hold the cryptocurrency directly. So that's like this big uh, benefit, supposedly, that it's easy for people. They don't have to buy it directly. Uh, we can see the ETF launch comes after seven years of crypto entrepreneurs and traditional finance firms have sought permission to launch this ETF in the United States, where um, applications have been continually been denied by the SEC. Uh, we can see down here, it says that um, the ETF based on futures bets on Bitcoin's price fluctuations rather than the underlying crypto itself. So that's something that's super important that you need to understand. I'm going to explain that to you. And we can see here the new ETFs will provide exposure to Bitcoin that is almost as costly and inefficient as can be imagined. Let me just read that to you one more time. Uh, the new ETFs will provide exposure to Bitcoin that's almost as costly and inefficient as could be imagined. That's not a good thing. What they're saying is it's as bad as you might imagine it to be. So what does that mean? Let's take a look at that. Well, the first thing that you have to understand is that there's really two types of ETFs. All right, there's two different things. Uh, we'll look at this. There's the futures ETFs versus the spot ETFs. Okay, there's two different ways, futures versus spots. Um, and the differences are that the futures um, ETF is basically betting on the price. They're betting on the price, it's gonna be you know, more or less in the future, but not actually on the underlying asset. Um, the spot ETFs uh, basically makes it where you're buying the asset to go up in value. So one is a bet against what the price is, the other one is actually buying the asset for it to go up in value. So that's the big differences. Now, there's a lot of risk and there's a lot of fees and a lot of costs, which is why they say it's inefficient as you might imagine, in this futures-based ETF. So I'm gonna break that down for you. But the first thing I wanna to explain to you is that the size of what this market could be. So we see right at the top, the global ETF market is seven times Bitcoin's one trillion market cap, which means the ETF market cap is $8 trillion, Bitcoin's one. So we have $8 trillion of ETFs. Um, and many people believe, uh, including uh, Nick, who did this analysis here, um, that ramifications from the impending Bitcoin futures are enormous and could potentially bring a wave of demand that could push the price to $100,000 in somewhat rapid fashion. As a matter of fact, uh, many analysts think we could see that happen before the end of the year, which is less than 90 days away. So to go from about 62,000 today to 100,000 in 90 days would be pretty amazing. Of course, we've seen it go up faster and farther than that back in 2017. Now getting into this, I want you to understand what this is because this is a futures-based ETF. It is not a spot-based ETF. Um, I'm not a fan of it. There's a lot of risks. I'm going to explain it to you. But first, let me explain to you what this futures ETF is. So um, a futures ETF, like I said, is betting on the price, not the underlying asset. So the first thing you have to understand is that um, pretty much all prices 
are driven by supply and demand. So um, if there's more demand than there is supply, then the price goes up, right? Pretty simple to understand. So um, under normal circumstances, if I was, if more people were to buy Bitcoin, hoping that the price goes up, um, that sucks up the supply, right? There's more demand on the supply and the price goes up. The problem with futures is that they are only betting on the price. They're not actually buying it. So what happens is people who want to participate in the price of Bitcoin going up, they think it's a good place to park their money. Um, instead of them buying Bitcoin like they should and then pushing the price up, they'll, instead of putting that money there, they just bet on it over here. And so that money never makes it into the Bitcoin market. It never soaks up the supply. It never increases the demand and therefore it doesn't change the price like it should. And so um, it almost in a way creates more Bitcoin because it allows people to buy Bitcoin or have exposure to Bitcoin's price without actually buying it. Now we've seen this, um, it's, it's rampant throughout the gold and silver industry. Um, people buy physical, I'm sorry, paper ounces of gold as opposed to physical. Um, it's reported that there's about 500 paper um, ounces of gold for every one single physical. So you have all these people that think they own gold but they don't, they have exposure to the price of gold, but the reality is they don't own gold. There's not, there's only one physical ounce for every 500 paper ounces. But going back to this, um, there's a lot of other problems with the futures that I wanna break down to you. So one of them is that um, future ETFs for any commodity experience um, have something, a risk known as bleed. And the bleed makes things dangerous and even uh, expensive and even dangerous for you. And so most commodity futures ETFs deal with negative roll yield. Each month they're forced to buy a more expensive contract than the one about to expire. So if the price of Bitcoin continues to go up, they have to buy each month, they'll roll it over into the next contract, the next contract, the next contract. But if the price of Bitcoin continues to go up, they have something known as the bleed. So let me show you how this breaks down. So uh, we can see that as of Friday's close, the November contract is $315 more than the month before than October. And that's $310 more expensive than the month after that. Um, and so basically what happens is each month it's getting more expensive. And as they roll that over, the bleed, the costs get passed down to the holders. You, if you buy this futures ETF, they're pushing those expenses down to each month. Um, this type of positively sloping futures curve is called Contango. All right, that's the name. You've probably heard that before. And Contango is not the friend of commodity futures ETF investors. It's not your friend because it just makes it more and more expensive. It says here, Bitcoin spot ETFs will not experience a bleed and they won't experience a bleed because you're just buying a spot. Remember, you're buying the asset itself as opposed to betting on it. The bleed comes from betting on it and every month having to roll that contract over if it keeps getting more and more expensive. Um, and so that's something to understand. Now, so if that's the case, if it doesn't affect the supply and demand, um, if there's a lot of fees involved with it, then why would anybody buy it? And when I say a lot of fees, I mean a lot of fees. So not only do we have the bleed, that's an issue here. As a matter of fact, we would have, um, I wanna talk about this cash and trade. We'll talk about that, but there's this arbitrage fee. You have the ETF provider charges fees. You have lawyers that provide um, charge fees, administrators, auditors, um, and they're all taking a slice from your pie as opposed to you just going and buying Bitcoin directly yourself. So you could just go buy it yourself, pay your small fee to buy it and hold it and that's it. Or you can get involved in one of these, have the bleed, um, have um, the providers, the lawyers, administrators all taking a slice of your pie, which doesn't sound really good. So if that's the case, then why would anybody do that? Well, part of the reason why is because it may be the only way for people to do that. So let me explain. So we can see here the global ETF market, like I said earlier, is, is about $8 trillion. It's growing at it 26% per year, which is massive, right? Now, if we, if we can finally have a Bitcoin ETF, um, that can slide right into this $8 trillion market crap, uh, cap and, and grab a large portion of all that new money that's flowing in. Um, year to date, Bitcoin's price is up 112%, but if a futures ETF provide um, a 12% roll yield, then the ETF would have doubled in price, all right? So that means investment managers all around the world want to get involved, but the problem is a lot of them are not able to do that. So financial advisors, Charles Schwab, Fidelity, things like that, they're not able to do that. And that's because of this. Fiduciaries call investment guidelines or mandates. And so they have mandates that don't allow them to buy um, 
commodities, only securities. So you can see here, those same guidelines would prevent an investment manager from buying gold coins and storing them in a vault. Same reason, because they're a commodity. They're not a security, not a stock. Um, and so um, if they can have this ETF fund, this way to get access to Bitcoin, now they can finally buy it. And so we can see here, investment managers will therefore be tripping over themselves to have access to the Bitcoin price exposure without dealing with it as a commodity. So it's a way that they can get into, uh, get access to the Bitcoin price without actually buying it and without m violating their mandates that they have. All right, now there's um, something else that I wanna explain to you and that's what's called a cash and carry trade. And so what the cash and carry trade is is part of this contango, um, this bleed that we're talking about. And so what happens is when you're selling, you have the, the, you're betting on the future price of Bitcoin. And so what happens is in this cash and carry, you have selling futures of a commodity and then buying spot. So you're selling the future, you're betting on the future price, but then you're buying it today when a risk-free profit can be achieved. So basically what this would be like selling the December Bitcoin futures contract for 60,805 on Friday afternoon and then buying spot Bitcoin for 63,000. So basically what you're doing is you're selling it in December. Someone's guaranteeing to buy it from you for 63,800, but I can buy it for 63,000 today. So I'm guaranteed to make $805, guaranteed. Someone has already committed to buy it from me and I can buy it right now today and then deliver it to them in September, I'm sorry, in December. Now, 805 doesn't maybe sound like a lot of money, but when you're a hedge fund dealing with billions of dollars and you can make a 100% risk-free trade, it's a pretty dang good deal, all right? With demand for Bitcoin futures about to blast off, the ETF inflows, future prices will continue to trade at a material premium to spot price, attracting arbitragers to the market to bank the cash and carry trade. So all these arbitrage people will come in and they'll try to bank that risk-free trade, which will also start pulling money out of the market. But also we could see all that demand come in and start to push the price back up or continue to push the price back up, which continues to push that bleed forward. So being an ETF holder, you're going to get bled dry. Let's just call it that. Now, let's take a look at this chart here. Um, I want to see this chart right here. And you can compare um, the Bitcoin futures to date to the actual price of Bitcoin. Um, and the the Bit Bitcoin futures is the yellow line here. The white line is the actual price of Bitcoin. And you can see that the um, Bitcoin futures has greatly underperformed um, holding Bitcoin only yourself. Uh, we can see here on Bloomberg, they say, well, you're probably better off buying Bitcoin than the futures. So for most people, you're better off just buying Bitcoin. Don't buy the futures because it's more costly um, and it's more complicated than just buying the cryptocurrency directly. Now, in 2013, when crypto investors, the Winklevoss brothers from Gemini, first tried to get the ETF through, at that time, Bitcoin was still pretty complicated. It was very difficult, it was technical, and so it wasn't easy for people. And so if we had an ETF, it'd be very easy to get people in. But today, it's so simple. If you can use PayPal or Venmo, you can figure out how to buy Bitcoin. Um, and so um, it's not as neat anymore. Now, the revolutionary thing about Bitcoin is that we can custody it ourselves. And so um, when gold was money for 5,000 years, the problem with gold, it was big, it was heavy, it was clunky, and it wasn't easy to move around. Um, so I would put it into a bank and then the bank gave me a paper gold certificate and I would trade the paper gold certificates, they would hold the gold. Um, but today with Bitcoin, we can take custody of it ourselves, And that is one of the ma major revolutionary things about it because what happened with gold is because it all went into the bank, it got centralized, then the bank started to manipulate the supply of the paper gold certificates. They printed so many paper gold certificates, there wasn't enough gold to go around. And in 1933, um the United States made it illegal to hold gold. Now they didn't have to go around and seize everybody's gold because it was already in the banks. And all they had to do is they shut the banks down for a banking holiday. When they opened the banks back up, you weren't allowed to get your gold out of the bank. With Bitcoin, if you hold your Bitcoin on an ETF or in on an exchange like Coinbase, there's counterparty risk. There's a chance you don't get that Bitcoin back. The revolutionary thing is that I can hold it myself. I can take custody of it myself. And it's so easy to do that we should do that, right? We don't wanna take on that counterparty risk. We don't wanna pay all those fees. 
And um, I can understand why some people might want access to it um, through an ETF because that may be the only way they can buy it. So for example, like I said, if you're in Charles Schwab or Fidelity, um, you have something like that, then you're only able to buy securities. And this may be the only way to get exposure to the price of Bitcoin. However, if that's uh, not you, then you should not be buying it that way. You should be buying it directly and take custody of it yourself. It's cheaper, uh, it has way less fees, um, it's safer. And as you can see from this chart that I have up on the screen, it has outperformed the ETF, the futures. Now, like I get it, a lot of people think it's gonna be big news. It's gonna bring a lot of people into the ecosystem, um, and it will, per what, what Nick's analysis says. He thinks this could push the price up over $100,000. In my personal opinion, we already have, multi, most of the countries already have ETFs. Uh, we already have things like the Grayscale's Trust that have made it easy for people to buy, and I don't think, personally, it's going to move the needle as much as many people are excited to see. But what do you think? Do you think this is the point that Bitcoin blasts off and gets up to $250,000? Or do you think Nick's projection of about $100,000, like what I'm saying, it's not gonna be that big of a deal, is more likely? Leave me a comment and let me know what you think about that. And as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. And if you don't like this video, that's okay. Give me a thumbs down, but at least leave me a comment and let me know why. Uh, and that's what I got for you today, all right? To your success. I'm out.